Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Public education is in peril. Efforts to reform public education are, ironically, diminishing its quality and endangering its very survival. We must turn our attention to improving the schools, infusing them with the substance of genuine learning, and reviving the conditions that make learning possible. So concludes Diane Ravitch's new book, The Death and Life of the Great American School System, How Testing and Choice Are Undermining Education. Joining me in the first of a two-part conversation on the death and life of the American school system is Diane Ravitch. She's research professor of education at New York University and is the preeminent historian of American education. Professor Ravitch is also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. From 1991 to 1993, Professor Ravitch was Assistant Secretary of Education and Counselor to the U.S. Secretary of Education. She is the author of 10 books and has edited 14 others, and she has written more than 500 articles and reviews for scholarly and popular publications. The New York Post calls her an educational poobah. <laughs> Welcome, Diane. Wonderful to be with you, Doug. Congratulations. This book really has stimulated a national conversation. Talk about the response to the book. Well, you know, I, I thought the book would be uh, have a major impact because I'm, I take issue with almost everything that's happening today. Uh, it's, I'm critical of the movement towards privately managed schools, critical of vouchers, critical of testing and accountability. Uh, and meanwhile, everybody's going in the other direction. Uh, this is really, I mean, a, a, a classic example of revisionism and, pol and, and polemics. Talk about, talk about how this all started. How did you come to write this book? It's been described as, you know, an intellectual odyssey, the result of an intellectual crisis, an epiphany. Right. Talk about how you came to write this book. Well, I mean, I, I have to begin by saying that I've had a consistent core of belief. The core of belief is that I would like to see every child get a really wonderful education. And I define education as consisting of not just basic skills of reading and math and writing, but also uh, history and literature, geography, civics, sciences, the arts. I think the arts are terribly important, uh, physical education, all of that. And within a context where there are adults who care about children and care about the development of their character and their self-discipline. So that's my vision. And in the early 90s, uh, I was invited to join the first Bush administration. Um, and I, it, having been immersed in that administration for almost two years, I came out thinking, well, maybe choice is one of the ways we can get this way. The school system seems Im impervious to change. Uh, maybe choice in competition will create a stimulus to improvement. So I became a supporter of choice. I wrote articles uh, supporting, in, in one case at least, vouchers uh, for poor kids. I also wrote articles and, and uh, actively spoke out for charters. Uh, I was a proponent of testing and accountability, thinking, well, at least we need to know where kids are, then we can measure if they're making progress, and getting that information out there will lead to more progress. Uh, and when No Child Left Behind was proposed, I said, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, so I was kind of carried along, and I described myself as having drunk the, uh, the Kool-Aid, in effect. Mm -hmm. um, but then in the, a few years after No Child Left Behind passed, I, I began to look, listen and watch, and I was, I'm always reading everything I can about what's happening across the country, and I realized that uh, things were not working. Um, I went to a conference at one of the conservative think tanks, and I, I was very involved in two conservative think tanks, one at the Hoover Institution and the other, uh, the Thomas B. Fordham Foundation. So I was really in the, in the belly of mm -hmm. the conservative establishment. Beast, if you will. Beast, if you will, or establishment, if you will. And um, everybody was very strongly for choice, for accountability, um, and uh, Testing and accountability were very, very important, and choice was very important. But in 2006, I was invited to a conservative think tank, American Enterprise Institute, uh, where there were a dozen scholars who came from across the country to talk about whether No Child Left Behind was working. How are the remedies working? 
And person after person got up and said, it's not working in New Jersey, it's not working, Choice is not working in New Jersey, it's not working in Miami, it's, it's after school tutoring, kids aren't applying even when it's free and it's in their own school, it's not working in rural Kentucky. And then they just went, not, not in California, not here, not there. And my, my job was to summarize the proceedings of the day and I said, I guess it's not working, right? So I began to look very skeptically from that point on and seeing more and more evidence that all these things associated with No Child Left Behind were either not working or were being rejected by parents or that profiteers were moving in and making millions and millions of dollars off programs that weren't working. And then in the fall of 2007, um, the national test scores came out, uh, fed federal test, and it said, showed me that it wasn't working. There was no progress, uh, very minimal gains in mathematics, um, and the gains were smaller than they had been before No Child Left Behind, and reading no gains at all. And so I did an article at that time in fall of 2007 in the New York Times uh, called Get Congress Out of the Classroom. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, and that's three years ago, uh, almost three years ago, I've been writing critical articles. So there was, although it may seem like an overnight transition because the book is brand new, mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if, if I look back over the past three years, or almost four years, I've been writing critically about all the things that are going on now. And the book is the crystallization, crystallization of that critique. Okay. In the book, you make a very interesting point about the contrast of looking at the world as a professional historian and looking at the world as a policymaker. And you, and you suggest that looking at the world from the policymaker's point of view distorts what's really happening and gives you a, a, a misplaced sense of reality. Right. Well, you know, you, I, I make a contrast between seeing like a historian, which is that you observe what's going on and try to explain it, and then seeing like a state. Seeing like a state is the title of a book uh, by a guy at, at Yale named, um, I think it's James Scott, wonderful book where he describes how the policymakers look down at the people and the people are like little ants to them, and then they design huge projects design policies that are, everyone else is supposed to fit into, mm -hmm. uh, but they have no sense of how it's going to work on the ground. And, and as Scott writes about this, and, and it was like an aha minute reading his book because I thought, yeah, you know, you've got to pay attention to what's happening on the ground, and on the ground is the classroom. And when you see situations where the teachers are saying again and again, this is not working, this is distorting everything I do, the kids aren't learning, the kids are not engaged, they're not motivated, but the policies don't hear that. The policymakers don't hear it. The policymakers are in D.C. Well, you're hearing it because looking at your blog, you literally got hundreds of blog postings from teachers, extensive, describing exactly right. the situation you are talking about. But on one side, it looks like you've got Diane Ravitch, revisionist, polemicist, and lots of frustrated, concerned, and angry people. And then on the other side, you've got money and power, immense money and power, private money and private power and public money and public power all on one side of this debate. Talk about sort of the constellation of forces out there. Right. Well, this, this has been in a way a, a, an eye-opening experience for me, just going out and talking about the book. Originally, I thought I would be going book tour to Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco. It's turned into a national tour that doesn't seem to end because I've now uh, this is uh, beginning of June. I've spoken in about 30 or 35 places. I have another 30 coming up. I've been all over the country. I've spoken to thousands and thousands of teachers. And everywhere I go, people say, we don't, what's happening is terrible. Uh, it's, it's really destroying education. Uh, the accountability is ridiculous because people are going to be fired who shouldn't be fired. Schools are going to be closed that shouldn't be closed. And how do we stop it? And then you look, well, who's pushing these bad ideas? And it starts with No Child Left Behind. It does, then goes on to Race to the Top. I'm going to uh, talk about all, both of these. And, and these, the policies represented by No Child Left Behind and now Race to the Top have the support of the major foundations. I'm speaking about the Bill Gates Foundation, which is $30 billion, or maybe by now it's 50 or $60 because Warren Buffett added his right. billion, billions. Right. Uh, and then the Eli Broad Foundation, which is a multi-billion dollar foundation. The Walton Foundation, which has been promoting choice and vouchers and charter schools all over the country for years, and that's a multi-billion dollar foundation. And then you have groups like Democrats for Education Reform, uh, which is hedge fund managers who have invested millions and millions into pushing Now, this is the new, the uh, you know, uh, philanthropy du jour, if you will, for the, the economic elites. Right. Explain. 
Well, uh, I, I've, after I finished my book, I, I, I discovered that uh, it wasn't just the billionaire foundations, it's actually the billionaire hedge fund managers who are heavily invested in promoting uh, privatization, uh, and charter schools in particular. Uh, the charter schools uh, were just an idea 20 years ago, now there are 5,000 of them. Uh, the, the media, not entirely, but mostly has bought into this idea that every charter school is like an elite private school, which is, you know, I, I take a lot of flack because I pointed out it's not true. And now there's a lot of research that shows it's not true. The average, uh, in aggregate, if you look at the 5,000 charter schools, mm -hmm. they produce about the same kinds of performance as the regular public schools. They're not better. So we're not dealing here with facts. We're dealing here with, it seems to be, an ideology. What makes the true believers true believers? Well, I think that the uh, people behind the charter school movement represent different different wings of the charter school movement. First of all, for many people, it's, it's like the, the, the far right has never believed that government should be running schools to begin with, but they never had much impact. They pushed vouchers for a long time, and whenever vouchers came up in a state referendum, they were soundly defeated. Most Americans don't want schools to have vouchers. Uh, so with the repeat, repeated defeat of the voucher movement, although we, we now have three cities with vouchers, and we should talk about that, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Cle and District of Columbia. Right. But nonetheless, the voucher movement has been stalled. So charters for the anti-government people has become their functional replacement of And vouchers. charters are what? Just define what yeah. they are and the role that they, they have played and are playing and perhaps will play. Well, what happens with a charter is that uh, an entrepreneur or a community group or mom and pop or, or a chain, uh, like a, an, a chain of, of charter manager, management organization, will say to a state, I'd like to run a charter in, uh, maybe they want to run it in, in Nassau County mm -hmm. or Suffolk County or Westchester or New York City. And they'll go to the, the either the regions, uh, depending, every state has different authorizers. Right. So in New York State, it would be either the state university or it would be the regions, mm -hmm. and they would say, uh, I'm going to produce higher test scores and, and here's my business plan. And then they'll say, you, you can't have a charter, we don't like your business plan, or you, here's your charter, you can now open a school. They don't need to go to the local school board and get their permission. Uh, they don't, uh, if, they, if they get a charter in New York City, uh, and they've, and, and it, I don't know how the, whether the new law changes this, but in the past, the chancellor has been able to open charters. Mm -hmm. So New York City now has, I think, 99 charters, and it will in the future, because of the change in the law, have an additional 114. Right. The chancellor can then say, well, I'm putting a charter into PSX. Which and, has created and, a, a major controversy, right. and in fact, the court uh, just recently ruled against the city both closing schools and also shoehorning schools, uh, charter schools, into existing public schools. Well, not really. I mean, they, the court ruled that they, they, they were closing 19 schools. Right. Uh, the law said they had to have a hearing. Well, they had the hearing. 3,000 parents and teachers and children showed up. They listened to them till 3 in the morning. Everybody was supposed to closing the schools, and they voted at 3 in the morning to close the schools. So then the court said, well, you didn't procedurally do exactly all the, you didn't oh, okay. you know, dot so the I's across the So it wasn't substantive. It was totally so then procedural. They went ahead and assigned children to all the other schools and didn't assign them to those 19 schools. So those schools are, in effect, going to die. Uh, even though the court said they couldn't be closed, they will die because to, to the community, these are schools that are on life support. Uh, so they will eventually close. It'll be, for any one of them, if any of them survives, it will be something of a miracle. Uh, as for what they call co-locations, the, what the parents call them are charter school invasions. Uh, what the Department of Education calls them are co-locations. So if a school has a few empty classrooms, boom, they pop in a charter school. This happened in Red Hook in Brooklyn, for instance, where there's a school there, PS15. They had some classroom space, uh, some under-enrollment. In comes the charter school. The charter school, which is called Pave Academy, is founded and run by uh, a billionaire. Why he couldn't buy his own space, I don't know. He says at some point he'll buy a space, he'll build a space. Mm -hmm. But in the meanwhile, the existing public school has to share space and is continually and being creates, crowded. This, this creates conflict, problems, resource allocation. What's the nature of the difficulty? What's problematic about that situation? Well, the first thing that's problematic is that the existing public school loses space for almost everything it might have been doing other than classrooms. Mm -hmm. It'll lose the room that was set aside for dance or for computers or for the art rooms. Okay. They have to share the gym, they have to share the auditorium. So suddenly there are two schools under two different leaders. Uh, one has extra resources. I mean, the, the, most of the charter schools have philanthropists uh, who make sure that all the kids have whatever they need. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the public school, uh, typically the classes are overcrowded 
and uh, they're under-resourced. So you have an under-resourced and, and a fully resourced school in the same building, and one is a charter and the other is a regular public school. So the two major big ideas, and you talk about big ideas and the, na and the nature of big ideas, were you know, choice and accountability. And under choice, you've got two examples, vouchers, which seem to have lost their steam. You mentioned they exist only in three cities. And charters, which seem to be, this is the big idea. Mm -hmm. And magic bullets can kill. Now, the question is, are, the, are these bullets designed to kill the public school system? Is that the inevitable result of all of this, the sort of the death of the public school system? And will it be intentional? Well, the, the original idea behind charters was that they were going to be created. This is the original idea going Go back ahead. to 1988. And the idea came from two men, Al Shanker, the head of the right. AFT, and then a, a little-known professor in Massachusetts. And at the same time, both of them said, wouldn't it be a great idea if public school teachers could step back and say, say to their colleagues, we would like to create a, a, a small independent school within the public school system. Well, let's call it a charter school. And then we would like to then go out and recruit the kids who dropped out or the kids who are about to drop out, take the toughest cases, and free of all rules and regulations, let's see what we can do to help the public right. schools. So whatever lessons we learn, we bring back. And everybody said, this sounds like a good idea. That was why Shanker advocated right. it. It was not seen as a threat to public education, but as a collaboration with public education. Okay. As the idea has evolved, though, uh, Shanker actually turned against charter schools in 1993, having advocated them in 1988. By 93, he said, charters have now turned into an opportunity for private businesses to enter the public sector, and they want to privatize schools, and that it's become indistinguishable from vouchers. So from 93 until his death in 96, he became a ferocious critic of his own idea. Talk about turning around. Right. Uh, but... Uh, What's happened is they're, they're now, from this idea of 20-something years ago, charters have now become not collaborators with public education, but competitors. And designed and, to be competitors. And designed to be competitors, because the, the people who are pushing charters, or, as I said before, a lot of them come from the voucher wing. And they say, competition is good. Competition will cause the public schools to get better. Well, the economists rule. I mean, it's a very market-oriented uh data driven and and but the data if it doesn't agree with what the the ideology is you ignore the data right. let's go let's 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 go to no child left behind what you mentioned you've characterized it as a failure that it created perverse incentives what how did it fail and why did what's the nature of its failure and how did it fail and why did it fail well it failed for in several ways first of all the remedies don't work. The remedies are choice and tutoring. And it turns out that from the studies I've seen, most of the kids don't want to have after school tutoring. They figure, I've been to school now for seven hours a day. I don't want to do after school. They're just not going. And even in districts where there have been evaluations, they're finding out that many of the tutoring companies were for profit companies that came in specifically to um, do this job, even though they had no qualification mm -hmm. to do it. And they're not seeing results from the tutoring. So that's one failure. The other is the choice provision. Most districts where the choice is needed don't have enough good schools to send the kids to anyway. So if you have a district where most of the schools are low performing, uh, there are no really better school, or very few much better schools that th those kids can go to. So that's not worked either. So the, the, these are the remedies for choice and tutoring. They haven't worked. The sanctions, which were to close schools, to privatize schools, to turn them into charter schools, to fire the staff, to fire the principal, restructuring of one kind or another, Study after study has shown they didn't work either. They did not. The only successful way to turn around a low-performing school is to kick out the low-performing students and to bring in higher-performing students. And this is what many of the uh, school operators have done. Okay, you talk about a fatal flaw in No Child Left Behind. What was the? What is the fatal flaw? Well, I and from my view, the fatal flaw is the high-stakes testing. That when you say. And, and also this deadline that, that by the year 2014, 100% will be proficient. That is the fatal flaw. What were, what were they taking? What were they ingesting, <laughs> injecting, well, or inhaling? Right. If, if, I, if, if Congress had passed the law saying that by the year 2014, uh, every city will be crime-free, that would be a nice thing. You know, we'd all like to be crime-free. Everybody would agree it's a good goal. Right. But if they also said, if you're not crime-free starting in a certain year, we're going to begin firing policemen. 
and we're going to close down police departments. That's what they're doing to schools. We now have a third of the schools in America identified as failing schools because they have not been able to move towards that 100 percent goal that was completely out of sight. Okay, so, so you've got this unrealistic goal, but this unrealistic goal has very practical adverse consequences. Right. In fact, you almost describe a law of perverse consequences here. What, what are these perverse consequences of this goal? Right. What happens when you have high stakes testing, meaning that you say to teachers and you say to schools, if you don't meet this goal, we're going to close you down, we're going to fire you, uh, you're going to be stigmatized as failing, you know, you're gone. What You get cheating, uh, in which we've seen cheating scandals all over the country now. I was just in Baltimore last week and one of the highest performing schools uh, was revealed in the Baltimore Sun as having massive cheating. Georgia's had a massive cheating scandal. Texas has had, I mean, all over the country, they're cheating I scandals. I mean, even if you don't cheat, you, you game the test. Right, and then the states, the states are gaming the test. Districts are gaming the test. Test prep is a form of cheating. And we now have districts spending millions, of, hundreds of millions, maybe even billions, to prepare kids to take a state test. Go so, ahead. so they take the state test, they pass. But if you substitute a test of the, exactly the same subject that they weren't prepped for, they can't pass it. They can only pass the one they were prepped for. So, I mean, so there's cheating. Gaming there's, the system. There's gaming the system. There is yeah. teaching to the test. Teaching to the test. And, and narrowing the curriculum. And, and, and also lowering the cut score. Like, for example, right. a 65 isn't really 65 in some cases. It's a 34 right. or a 46. So in order to meet this 100% goal and, and the steps in keep between. Lowering, lowering, lowering the standards. Because you've got to keep raising, right. raising, raising the numbers. So right. the, the very testing, you may improve the test scores but make the education worse. Right. I, I think that's well, part of that, this, or your entire well, argument. Well, exactly. This, this is like an educational Ponzi scheme that's been created by the federal government, uh, which is to continue raising the pass rates by lowering the, the standard. I mean, in New York State, uh, as of 2009, to be, to be declared proficient in seventh grade math, you needed only to answer 44% of the questions correct. 44% to be called proficient. Wasn't that a failing grade at some point? No, <laughs> excuse me. I mean, at least when I, I went to school, it was. So we move from no child left behind to race to the top. We move from George Bush to Barack Obama and on Duncan. What's the difference between race to the top and... No Child Left Behind. It's No Child Left Behind 2.0. Yeah, I mean, well, he's clearly sided with the economists and the yeah. corporate-style reformers. I mean, th th you make an interesting point, and I think it's worth elaborating on about the economists. It used to be that education research was dominated by psychologists who understood how children learn. Right. Then it was dominated by sociologists who looked at, uh, you know, the conditions of learning and the relationship between home and family and school and the community. All of these things were very important. These guys are now out officially. We are now basing major, major policy decisions on economists. Economists believe that the world moves by incentives and sanctions. And so how do you incentivize learning? You have high stakes. How do you, how do you incentivize better teaching? Uh, you threaten to fire the teachers. You threaten, threaten to close the school. I mean, there's this big thing now about turning around failing schools. The turnaround model consists of coming to a school and saying, if you don't change the test scores in this school, we're going to close the school. That's the that's turnaround, not turnaround model. That's turnaround. I mean, that's, you <laughs> that's know, the, terminating. Right. That's the threatened model. Anyway, that from, from Bush to Obama, uh, I, one of the major responses that I've had, both from the hundreds and hundreds of emails that I've gotten in response to the book, as well as when I'm out and talking to teachers, people say they're so disappointed because they thought that Obama really was going to change everything. They really believed when he said, uh, I'm the change, change agent. And what teachers wanted most of all was to see the No Child Left Behind regime go away and be replaced by a much more humane vision of education. So uh, Obama, unfortunately, is uh, he's, he's bought into the same economist view of what moves people to change. So he, he is actually not throwing out No Child Left Behind. He's giving it a new name. I think it's going to be called College and Career Readiness by 2020 is, is the goal. Uh, but the, the testing becomes even more important. They say they want better tests, but in the meanwhile, we don't have those better tests. Uh, what they have through race to the top uh, encouraged the states to in create many more charter mm -hmm. schools. They said you're not even going to qualify. They have $5 billion or over $4 billion in stimulus money, which they dangled before the states, and they call it the Race of the Top Fund. And he brought in to run the Race of the Top Fund uh, the chief operating officer of a group called the New Schools Venture Fund. The New Schools Venture Fund exists to create charters. 
So when you bring in somebody who has background in charters, the first thing you uh, want is more charters, right? Okay. So every state has been told you can't, uh, you have to lift your cap or eliminate your cap on charters. Which and, just happened in New York just, State just, uh, today, yeah, uh, yesterday. In, in hopes of getting $700 million, which right. can't then be used to hire teachers or to plug budget gaps. The second thing that Race to the Top says is you must be ready to evaluate teachers by the test scores of their students and that will make the test scores even more important than they were under No Child Left Behind. And the third is a pledge to turn around low performing schools, including closing them and firing the staff. Oh, so this, this is No Child Left Behind, but with the screws even tighter. Not a very pleasant thought to end this first part of our conversation, but thank you for joining me t today, and we will be together next week to continue this discussion of um, the American education system, its prospects, its possibilities, and its policies. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.